And in this video, we take a look at some possible inconsistencies which still exist concerning the official narrative surrounding the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Firstly, let's take a look at a police statement which could suggest that Tucker, Tate and Rolf had prior knowledge of Workhouse Lane before their deaths on December the 6th, 1995. The following police statement is from Paul Allen Draper, dated the 18th of December 1995. I live in Great Baddo, Essex and work at Runwell Hospital as a thermal insulation engineer. Although I work from Runwell Hospital, this is only where my office is and I work all over Essex. At least twice a week and sometimes more regular, I go to my office in Runwell. When going there from home, I always travel in either my own vehicle or my wife's and use the A130 road which takes me through Ressendon and then towards Runwell. My vehicle is a red Ford Sierra Estate, vehicle reg Echo 696, Oscar Mike Echo, and my wife Faye's vehicle is a red Ford Fiesta, vehicle reg Delta 202, Hotel Mike Delta. On Monday the 27th of November 1995, I again went to work via my office in Runwell. On that day, I recall leaving home to go to work at around 8.30am. On that occasion, I drove my wife's Ford Fiesta. I took the same route I always take to get to work and that is through Great Baddo into Mulrooms Lane and down the slip road onto South End Road and finally straight across the roundabouts under the A12 and then onto the A130 heading towards Rettendon. Whilst travelling along the A130, my attention was drawn to a vehicle travelling in front of me. This vehicle was a dark metallic blue Range Rover. My attention was drawn to this vehicle as it started to indicate to turn left off the A130 and I was travelling behind it. The Range Rover, like myself, was travelling towards Rettendon and its indicators came on just after it had passed White House Farm which was on the left. At first I thought the vehicle was going to turn off further up the road. However, I saw the brake lights come on earlier and then saw it turn down a dirt track on the left. I have knowledge of this dirt track as I know the farmer Mr Theobald and I know there is a lake at the end of the track where fishermen go. Due to this I thought the people in the vehicle were going fishing. I never thought anything more of this sighting until a week later when there was news about an incident down the track involving a Range Rover and I therefore contacted police. I would best describe the Range Rover I saw as a newish style although I cannot recall the number plate. The vehicle had flash looking wheels in that they had three spoked wheel trims which were the same colour as the vehicle. When the vehicle turned left I could see there was something in the boot although I cannot recall what. However having thought about that day I did not see any rod holders as the back seats were up and if they were fishermen with rods they would have probably been sticking up. The vehicle had a driver and one front passenger. I would describe the driver as a white male of stocky build with probably longer hair than the front passenger. I would describe the front passenger as a white male of stocky build with short dark hair. Both front seats I recall had headrests. Although I was behind the vehicle when it turned off the A130, I cannot remember when I got behind it. I do know the Range Rover did not turn into my path and I believe I may well have caught up to it as I travelled along the A130. When the Range Rover turned left into the track, the time would have been between 8.40 and 8.50am as it only takes me 10 minutes or so to get to that area when I travel from home and I usually arrive at work in Runwell around 8.50 to 9am. I am certain of the date being Monday the 27th of November as I recall that week going into my office twice and the first time was a Monday morning. After the Range Rover had turned left and entered the track, I passed it and looked down briefly where I saw the vehicle slowly driving along the track. 
I have not seen the vehicle since that date. So why is this particular statement of any real importance? Well, it was put forward by the prosecution in court that Michael Steele was in the Range Rover that evening in order to guide Tucker, Tate and Rolf down to Workhouse Lane. This is something which has been discussed and debated over the years regarding this case. Did these three individuals know of Workhouse Lane? Did they know of White House Farm? Now what's interesting there about that statement is the fact that it mentions that the driver has longer hair than the front seat passenger or potentially has longer hair. So many people will probably hear that and say well it can't be the Range Rover, it would have been Rolf who was driving, it would have been Tucker who was in the front passenger seat who had the longer hair, but could it have been Tucker that was driving on this occasion? Some people know and many people don't know that Tony Tucker actually knew the brother of the farmer who found them dead on December the 7th. So did Tucker know of White House Farm? Was he aware of Workhouse Lane? I would say with a fair deal of certainty, speaking from my own personal opinion, that they did know of Workhouse Lane, that Tucker had some kind of distant relationship, some sort of distant friendship with the farmer's brother. They'd known each other for quite a few years, used to train at the same gym at one point in time. So it's quite likely that Tucker actually knew of the farm and the dirt track. So how does that change the official narrative? Now the official narrative is that Michael Steele pulls up at the halfway house, he gets out of his Toyota Hilux and gets into the Range Rover with Tucker, Tate and Rolf. And the very reason for this, the very reason for the whole meet that evening is that Steel is going to show them somewhere, he's going to lead them somewhere. Whether that's some, somewhere where a product or drugs are going to be dropped, whether that's where a, a plane is going to be landed, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is that in Donna Jagger's statement and you know, from the prosecution's own mouth, what we also hear in countless documentaries, is that Steel got into that Range Rover with the sole purpose of leading them to a specific location. Now from here, we need to ask ourselves, well, what purpose would it serve to have Michael Steele in that Range Rover if at least one of these individuals knew of that location? They knew of Workhouse Lane. You could say it's the vehicle. They're in a Range Rover, it's easy to get down the track, but that doesn't make much sense because Michael Steele is driving his own 4x4 vehicle. He's driving a Toyota Hilux, which could have quite easily have gone down the lane, no problem. If they did in fact know of this lane, as in Tucker, Tate and Rolf, then it really kind of discredits the, the need for Michael Steele to meet them at the halfway house at all. It wouldn't actually serve much of a purpose. Now this is, as I say, put forward as the official narrative for the evening of December the 6th. The fact that these four individuals, Tucker, Tate, Rolf and Michael Steele, travel from the halfway house pub car park to the bottom of Workhouse Lane. It's there that Jack Wombs is waiting in nearby bushes to spring the ambush. Now what also counts against the official narrative being possibly slightly off or completely incorrect is the fact that we're also told that as the Range Rover enters the start of Workhouse Lane, Pat Tate's phone begins to ring. This is Sarah Saunders, they have a telephone conversation, a short telephone conversation, where Sarah Saunders in her police statement claims that Pat Tate basically just said, I can't talk now, everything's fine, we'll sort things out tomorrow or, or I'll see you in the next couple of days. I can't talk now, I'm with some people. But that phone call lasts just under four minutes in duration. So could it be that the Range Rover was down the lane for some time? Now this was surmised also by defence counsel. They talk about the soot deposits under the exhaust, indicating that the Range Rover had been left there running for some time. We know that the Range Rover was found on the 7th of December with the engine switched off. From here on, we are told that Michael Steele exits the back of the Range Rover behind Craig Rolf, the driver, leaving that rear door open. Jack Wombs approaches the open door and the shooting begins. But let's now take a look at some other evidence which could cast some doubt on this particular part of the official narrative. We have Craig Rolf who is driving, Tony Tucker in the front passenger seat and Pat Tate in the rear. The other rear passenger according to the prosecution was Michael Steele. As the Range Rover turns off of Main Road down Workhouse Lane 
it reaches the locked five bar gate. Now it's at this point that the Range Rover pulls up to this locked five bar gate and the rear offside door opens. So that's the door behind the driver. That rear door opens and Michael Steele exits the vehicle. Most likely with the idea or suggestion of opening that locked five bar gate. As Michael Steele steps out of the vehicle, Jack Wombs approaches from nearby bushes and the shooting begins. Now, the first problem that I have with this are the tire tracks which are found at the crime scene. And you can see in the photograph in front of you here that the tire tracks actually extend past where the Range Rover is located. What I mean by that is that at some point in time, the Range Rover was further forward before going backwards to its stationary position that you see in front of you. Is that because the gate needed to be open? Is it because someone said, can you just drop it back a little bit? We don't know. What's quite interesting though is Dr. Lanas, the pathologist, one of the people who actually attended the crime scene, she said that the tire tracks actually extended beyond the locked five bar gate, but obviously the pictures and photographs that we have are, I guess, inconclusive. Now, Dr. Paula Lanas was the pathologist. She was responsible for ascertaining the time of death for Tucker Tate and Rolf. And as many of you all know, that never happened. Now, she's come under a lot of pressure over the years since these murders for some of her work on autopsies. And I guess really what I'm trying to get at here is can we really say of any great deal of certainty that she is observing these tread patterns, these tire tracks in the same way that we are? We're looking to match up these tread patterns. We're looking for the same tire patterns extending on beyond the locked five bar gate. Or is she simply observing a set of tire tracks going beyond the locked five bar gate? Obviously, there's a massive difference. The problem that we have is that we don't have clear enough photographs beyond that locked five bar gate to say either way. Now, the reason I say that is that it does go against the prosecution's version of events ever so slightly, in that the Range Rover literally pulls up, the back door opens, and the shooting starts almost instantaneously. But clearly here, the Range Rover has gone a little bit too far forward. Maybe someone has said to them, can you drop it back a bit? We need to open the gate, something along those lines. And we just really don't know how long that Range Rover was there for. Interestingly, the defence put forward the theory that it had been there for some time, due to the carbon deposits found in the puddle under the exhaust pipe. But the main point of interest which I am starting to disagree on is how this shooting originated. That the back door of the Range Rover opened up and the vast majority of the shots came from that open rear driver's side door. Looking at the shotgun cartridge positions and also the wounds to the individuals, I actually believe now that it was Craig Rolfe who was shot first from the open driver's door. Now this may sound a little bit bizarre, but just bear with me. Now, the supposed official version of events as told in countless books, movies, TV shows, documentaries regarding this case and put forward by the supposed getaway driver Darren Nichols on the evening of December the 6th is that the rear door behind the driver, the rear offside door, is opened by a fourth occupant. That illuminates the inside of the Range Rover. The gunman approaches, puts the gun against the headrest of the driver's seat and pulls the trigger, shooting the driver, Craig Rolfe, behind the head or behind the ear and rendering him dead immediately. From there, it's most likely Tucker who was shot next, followed by Tate in the abdomen, then really, I guess it's open to interpretation. Let's just say, for instance, the driver walks around the front of the vehicle, takes another shot at Tate from distance, which skims the top of Tate's head. He then walks closer and shoots him at point blank range. He then does the same to Tucker. And then we're led to believe that he walks around the front of the vehicle again, opens the driver's door and shoots Craig Rolfe square in the side of the face. Now, it's this shot here that I have quite a lot of difficulty in believing. Everything up to this point has been clinical, it's been clean. Apart from the one shot which skims the top of Tate's head, everything has been done for a particular reason, even down to the shot behind the ear. If you research that, the shot behind the ear, why that is done in most circumstances in terms of whether it be killing livestock or killing a human being, that shot behind the ear shuts down the central nervous system, stops the breathing, stops any sudden movement or I guess noise or whatever you want to call it, it shuts the body down dead. What would be the need to then shoot Craig Rolfe square in the side of the face 
after you had shot him behind the ear, behind the head, killing him instantly. What is the need for that extra shot? Also a point worthy of mention, at least in my opinion, is that this kill shot, the shot behind the ear, this is the shot which was administered last to Tucker and Tate, and I believe also last to Craig Rolfe. It's clear here that Tucker was shot in the jaw, shot across the face. Tate was shot in the abdomen, shot at towards the head from some sort of distance, which skimmed the top of Tate's head. And then the shot behind the ear was done afterwards. Then the shot to Tucker's head afterwards. It's all afterwards. The final shot is the kill shot behind the ear. Is it unreasonable to suggest that Craig Rolfe was first shot in the side of the face? then straight across the face of Tucker. Then the gun tracks to Tate, who is trying to make a feeble escape out of the back to the near side of the vehicle. He is then shot in the abdomen. Craig Rolfe, I believe, receives a shot behind the ear as the final shot. They don't want to touch the body. They don't want to touch the body. They want to move the head of Craig Rolfe in order to access that area behind the ear. So the gun is pushed against the headrest and the trigger is pulled. For anyone who may doubt that that's even a possibility, how do we explain the cartridge locations? That they're all forward of what would have been that rear open door. If the rear door is open on the driver's side, the gunman has leaned in to shoot Rolf by pushing the barrel of the gun against the headrest and pulling the trigger, followed by Tucker and Tate. How have the cartridges ended up the other side of that open door? To me, everything points to the fact that the vast majority of these shots were actually fired from the driver's door, the front of the vehicle, not the rear. Now, if that is the case, and bearing in mind this is just my own thoughts and opinions on the murder, I'm not saying this is categorical fact by any stretch of the imagination, but if this is the case, that the vast majority of the shots were fired from the open driver's door, this actually takes away the necessity for the fourth passenger. And what I mean by that is that we are told that the fourth passenger exits the rear of the car to open the locked five bar gate, leaving the door open and the car illuminated inside. This was the plan, to leave that door open so that the gunman could approach and the shots were fired. But if we take that out of the equation for one moment, let's just say it didn't start like that. The actual shooting did not originate from the rear of the vehicle. It actually takes away this necessity for there to be someone in the Range Rover traveling down the lane with them. Now, one aspect I think we can all agree on without a shadow of a doubt is that these men were caught by surprise. They were caught completely off guard now, how could that have happened? If Craig Rolfe's hands are on the steering wheel, if the vehicle is in drive, the foot's on the brake, etc., etc. Bear in mind, we don't really know the position of Craig Rolfe's foot because the bodies moved around in transit before they were back at the police pound. So really, we can't take anything for granted when it comes to the photographs which were taken after this Range Rover was moved. But what I'm looking at here, what I'm seeing in my own mind, is that if the Range Rover pulls up, they're there to meet someone that they trust, someone that they know. He opens Rolf's door to say, can you back it back a bit? You're a bit too close to the gate. The door is open at that point. Rolf is distracted. His hands are still on the steering wheel whilst the gunman approaches from the side. So it would still require at least two people to accomplish this, I would imagine, unless someone was incredibly quick and they literally sneaked up, opened the door, bang, bang, bang. But I just don't see that happening. I think there's at least two people involved here. Now, regarding the cartridges that you see in front of you there, I know many people will say, oh, you know, well, obviously they picked them up and dropped them somewhere else, you know, to confuse the crime scene. Just ask yourself, or if you can put in the comment section below, what you believe exactly that would have achieved. Because when I look at the following diagram here, when I look at where those cartridges were actually found, everything points to me, at least, that the shooting originated from the open driver's door. And the fact that Rolf is shot across the face, supposedly last, doesn't make any logical sense to me. Now if, as we are led to believe, the shooting did in fact originate 
from the rear of the vehicle, that the vast majority, not just the fact that the shooting originates from the rear of the vehicle. If the vast majority of the shots are fired from the rear of the vehicle, as we've been led to believe, then why are there not more cartridges inside the vehicle? You can see one on that diagram there. Clearly, that's the one where Rolf was shot. In my opinion, if we had have had more shots fired from that position, the rear open door, then surely the cartridges would have been found inside the vehicle, particularly as he would have had to have stretched in a little bit further or moved the gun a little bit further across inside the vehicle to have shot Tucker. Yet all we have here is one cartridge found inside that vehicle, where it, which is exactly where I would expect to find it if that rear door was in fact open. Now when I say one cartridge, one cartridge in terms of where I'd expect to have found it from that shot against the rear of the headrest of Rolf. Obviously we also have that other one which is found in the front of the vehicle, but clearly that's one of the shots from that open driver's door. So to summarise, and I believe in a video such as this, it is important to summarise exactly what I'm saying here. The first thing that points, in my opinion, to the fact that this shooting originated from the open driver's door is the fact that Craig Rolf is supposedly shot last across the side of the face, a shot which is completely unnecessary. This man is already dead and it didn't serve any purpose at all to shoot him across the side of the face after shooting him once already behind the ear. What also tips me off to it being a possibility that they were shot from the open driver's door is the fact that the kill shot, the shot which was administered last to Tucker and Tate, is behind the ear. And quite simply, I believe that is the same for Craig Rolfe. I believe he was originally shot across the face, Tucker across the face, and the final shot to Craig Rolfe was the putting the gun against the headrest and pulling the trigger, simply because they didn't want to touch the body, move the head, they couldn't access behind the ear without shooting through that headrest. Secondly, and most likely most importantly, are the cartridge positions. If the vast amount of shots originates from that rear driver side open door at the rear, how do we explain the cartridges being found the other side of that open door? How do we explain that the vast amount of shots appear to have been fired from the open driver's door at the front of the vehicle, not the back? How did those cartridges get there if the vast amount of shots were fired from that open rear door? What I find interesting about this potential theory here is the fact that it completely opens up possibilities as to how this crime was actually committed. We've been told for too long that the first shot was from the rear of the vehicle, the gun pushed up against the headrest. When, when we actually step back and look at what the crime scene is telling us here, in my mind at least, it's painting a completely different picture. It takes away the necessity for there to be someone travelling down in the Range Rover. It could also open up the possibility that they were actually meeting someone down the lane on the evening of December the 6th. 